Wahid Invest, Sarwa, Insha, Nia, Kestro, Crowd to Live, Launch Good, Aghaz, Ethis. There are so many more out there. These are all Islamic fintechs that are serving our needs across the globe. Clearly, there's something happening here. There is something happening that is causing so many Islamic fintechs to pop up into existence. And my view is that there are three key reasons for why this is happening. The first reason is because it is fundamentally something that Muslims need. Muslims are just way behind in getting access to Islamic finance, investment, personal finance, and these fintechs are allowing us to do that. The second thing is that this is just a big business opportunity as well, right? Because we're talking about, you know, in the mainstream world, you see Robinhood as a valuation of over $11 billion now. And even some of the smaller apps in the UK, like Monzo, Revolut, Starling, are all multiple billion dollar companies. So the opportunity here, if you crack it, if you crack this $2.1 trillion Muslim market, which has 1.9 billion Muslims living in it, is pretty vast if you can crack it. And then the third thing that I think is causing this bump in the number of Islamic fintechs is that for the first time in human history, it has become really easy to do this stuff. Like the technology and the regulation and all the stuff that goes into making an Islamic fintech has become accessible to the ordinary person without needing millions and millions of pounds to actually get going. But how do you actually go about building your own Islamic fintech from scratch? And what are the big areas that are still not occupied? Where are the gaps in this market? And what are the big challenges that you will definitely face when you go down this path? In this video, I'll go through all of those questions and more. The idea is that I want to give you a bit of a cookbook so that you can go about building your own Islamic fintech. If you're new to this channel, Islamic Finance Guru, or IFG for short, is a halal investment and personal finance platform that compares, analyze, and reviews all the latest and greatest products and investments that are coming out in the Islamic finance world. Our mission is really simple. We want to help Muslims everywhere get wealthier and put their money to work. If that sounds like it's up your street, then please do hit that like button and subscribe to our channel and follow us on our journey. And please do feel free to share this video with your friends and family as well. If you'd like to chat with me and join thousands of like-minded other individuals, then please do check our Telegram groups and the link for those is below and join our community. The first and most important step, and actually the one that most people will mess up on, is actually identifying very carefully your product and your market. And the reason why most people will mess up on this one is because they will not really, really talk to their customers in a way that they really understand what their customers' pain points are. And if you don't do that, then what you're doing is you're guessing. And when you're guessing, it's most likely that you're going to be wrong. And when you're wrong, that means you don't have a business. The second thing that you need to do is upskill yourself in Islamic finance itself. And I feel like a lot of people, they don't necessarily give this the due care and attention that they perhaps should do. Um, and what I mean by this is that Islamic finance is a complex technical world. And if you do not know about anything in this space, then you're going to struggle to really innovate effectively in this space as well. So there are courses out there these days that you could do. So CC do a course. We have our own Majalla course that we do, which is a two year long course where we spend every week thinking about the technicalities of Islamic finance and really getting to the grips with all this stuff. Um, but the point I'm making here is that to do an Islamic fintech product, to do an Islamic fintech well, you need to have that technical know-how, that Islamic know-how, that corporate commercial know-how. So make sure that you are at least bringing some of that to the table and then you're joining together with other people in the team to get the recipe that you need, the ingredients that you need to deliver on that Islamic fintech product in a way that works. Without that, you're going to really, really struggle. So bottom line is, upskill yourself. This is a journey. This is not an end in itself. And you need to keep on learning throughout this journey. The third thing that you will need to focus on is regulation. This is because this is a very sensitive area. You're dealing with people's money and finances and life savings. 
So if you mess up here, you're going to have some really serious implications. So that's why you need to be regulated. There are roughly two ways that you can go with regulation. The first is you can get directly authorized, i.e. you have a direct license with the FCA or whoever your regulator is. Or the second is you can come under the umbrella of someone who is already directly authorized and they kind of look after you and incubate you whilst you're still learning. So those are the two routes and there are pros and cons to both. If you go directly authorized, it's going to take you a lot longer, but then you'll be a lot more flexible and you won't have to pay anything to the appointed representative or the, you know, the, the direct firm that you're working with. But if you go under the, the appointed representative route, then there you will have a lot quicker delivery on the product itself, but you will be a little bit handicapped because you will have to work with someone else to be able to deliver that product. So there are pros and cons that you need to weigh up when you think about this stuff. The other thing to flag here is that inevitably in fintech, because it's such a regulated space and because fintech products are quite complex, you will be working with three or four or five potentially other partners who themselves are all regulated as well to be able to do the little bits and bobs that you need to do to put it together in a way that's compelling for the customer. Um, so don't get too bogged down in all this stuff as well, that you are inevitably going to be working in partnerships with people anyway. The next key thing is to make sure that the technology you have is fit for purpose and it's really strong. And what that means is, that you're going to have to really think about some trade-offs that you have to make. So with your main technology stack, your website or your app or whatever it is that you're building, are you doing it in-house or are you going to uh, outsource it to someone who's you know, potentially an expert in this field? That's something for you to think about and there are definitely pros and cons to that. Um, or are you going to build it on a no-code solution um, which doesn't need any coding background or are you going to have an in-house team that you're going to hire and hand code that really, really carefully? The things that you have to think about here are, you know, how much is it going to cost me? How much control do I have over this product? How quickly can I iterate on this product? How quickly can I potentially scale this product? Like, you know, having a product that goes from zero to 100 is one thing, but going from 100 to 10,000 is a completely different you know, kettle of fish. So you need to think about all of those things and you need to make sure that what you are doing is right for you as a business, right for your product, and most importantly, right for your customers. Without that, you're going to really struggle. My personal thoughts on all this stuff is that you should always try and build in-house to the extent that you can, as long as you can do it quickly. You shouldn't look to outsource everything because then you are beholden to lots of other people. Um, having said all of that, if you find that this is just a challenge that is insurmountable and this is potentially a regulated tech product as well, then it might make sense to outsource it. So these are all different calculuses and balances that you will have to weigh up for your own business. The final ingredient is the most special and important ingredient and is one that is often overlooked. Every mum has a special ingredient that they put into their biryani. This is that ingredient. This is what for my mum, I think is sugar. She puts that in her biryani. I don't, don't ask me why, but it's great. And that key ingredient is your team because the team is the fuel within the engine of the business that keeps this business really going as fast as you possibly can. If you fill it with that 95, then it's not going to necessarily be amazing. But if you fill it with that 97, then it's going to be a lot longer and it's going to be a lot more high quality. But at the same time, don't try and over-optimize and go for like, you know, the chairman of Google because he's realistically not going to join you and your random startup that has nothing to show for it uh, and, you know, give up a million dollar salary to work for you for like 20,000 pounds a year. It's just not going to happen. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that you hire the first person that comes across you and you just kind of settle for that. What you want to do is, you know, using where you are in the world, you want to try and punch above your weight, but also don't waste your time trying to punch way, way above your weight because it's just not going to happen. The other thing you want to think about is the composition of the team. You don't want to be too samey. You want to have people from a tech background, a sales background, an operational background, a product background, a regulation background if you need it. You need to combine all of those things together to make a complex but also harmonious team that will actually deliver the product that you're trying to build. So the good news is there are gaps everywhere in the market. Because Islamic finance is such a nascent and relatively underdeveloped area, there, are, there is just blue ocean 
everywhere that you look, right? So you've got in the public markets, equities, you've got lots of things that are still not to be done yet. In SME financing, in brokerage, in uh, you know, regulated advice, in fixed income products, alternative assets, crypto is booming. Like there are so many different areas and it's completely blue ocean. And what I mean by blue ocean it is that it's undiscovered, it's virgin territory, it's places that no one has ever been before and you would be able to be cutting the, the, the ground for the first time in those areas. So there's plenty of opportunity out there. And don't worry about too much competition in this market. This is a vast market and it's just getting started. And there's plenty of room for lots of people to operate in this space. And actually the more the merrier because it gets you to think creatively. A little bit of competition is always a bit healthy. And also competition is a good signal for you that you're also not wasting your time. Because if you're the only one who's come up with this great idea that no one else is doing, chances are it's probably not an idea worth doing and you're missing something. Uh, if it's not already been done before. So competition is good and don't worry too much about it. This is big as a space. Make sure that you don't just decide to do a fintech. Also do your research and spend a few weeks, perhaps you know, a month or two, just reading around this area, understanding it, talking to some of the key people in this space, reading the, you know, the Global Islamic Fintech report that a, a whole bunch of very reputable people have put out. Uh, look at the IFG Gaps analysis article that we did. I've put the link in the uh, description below. Look at all of that stuff and weigh it up. But then also don't become an academic. Don't spend like four years researching this area before you come up with something by which time it's all too late anyway. The other big thing that I would emphasize is having first principles thinking. Don't just do an idea that feels nice to you, that feels intellectually like it you know, makes sense. That would be a nice thing for you to be able to put on LinkedIn that I am a startup founder of X thing. Don't do that because that is not a business. That is just, you know, it's a vanity project potentially, it's an art project. It's not a business, right? You are trying to do the hard thing that customers will pay you money for, right? So make sure that you have that first principles thinking and be brave about it. Don't just be a copycat of what the mainstream are doing because the mainstream is not your audience. Your audience is the Muslim audience which has its own specific requirements. And anyway, who's to say that the mainstream guys have got it right in the first place? There are infinite variables in this world and the way you put those together to serve your audience could be in any way, uh, shape or form. Ultimately, if I was to boil all of that down into one thing, do what the customer wants. That's it. The biggest challenge is to get customers to pay you for something. And that sounds simple, but it's actually really hard to achieve. That means that you need to be able to connect to customers you need to be able to persuade them that this product that you have is going to solve a really pressing need that they have. And then once you've done that, you actually need to deliver a product that actually meets their needs. And then you need to retain them for the long term. And then you need to scale that whole process to, so that you can do it to hundreds of thousands of people. So this is a complex multi-stage process that delivers that very simple thing, which is sell customers stuff that they will pay you money for. The key thing here that people struggle with is that they don't do the hard thing. The hard thing I find, especially for people who are young in their entrepreneurial career, is talking to people, talking to customers, and talking to them in a way that you actually listen to the hard things, the hard truths that they're giving you. Talking to them when they are giving you negative feedback and listening to that carefully so that actually evolves you as a business and as a technology and as a person. That's the thing that you need to be able to do. Do the thing that others won't do. Go door to door, knock on doors and actually ask people what do they want. Give out flyers and leaflets. Make sure that you are standing on stalls in marketplaces or standing in stalls at conferences and actually speaking to people and going through that pain process where people are ignoring you and they might ignore you for months and months and months and you have to be steadfast. Do that hard stuff because that is what is actually going to distinguish you from the rest of the competition. And it's really difficult to do that. And of course, look, IFG can help with this. Islamic Finance Guru is an Islamic Finance Marketplace. So once you've got a great product, then please do talk to us, right? We will help you get in front of hundreds of thousands of um, Muslim consumers every single month. But, you know, we are only one bit of this puzzle. If you don't have the product, if you don't have the team, 
that's not going to ultimately succeed. But of course, we will help you with this journey in any way we can. The second biggest challenge that you're gonna face is getting the regulation and the technology right. These things are hard because they take a lot of time and they take a lot of money. And the two things that you do not have much of right now are time and money. So the way that you become successful in these situations is becoming excellent at making good decisions and honing your instincts to make good decisions in situations of extreme uncertainty. And the way that you do that is by making sure that you have a really solid data-driven process in place for your decision-making and you constantly refine that data-driven solid decision-making process so that it becomes better and better. I know that sounds very easy and nice to hear, but actually to deliver on that is very, very difficult. And look, I'm, I'm on that journey myself, uh, but crack it and you've got yourself a really good team and a really good business potentially. The third biggest challenge is your own mindset. So what I mean by this is that don't live in dreamland. Don't build an idealized conception of what you think a startup should look like or feel like. You know, hiring people who are 15 or 20 people without any real idea of what they're going to be doing because all that is going to be doing is creating a recipe for disaster. Build the thing that your customer wants. And then also from a mindset perspective, have an attitude of we will do this, right? This is the goal and we will achieve that regardless of any of the obstacles in our way. Don't be someone who listens to the first objection or the second objection or the third objection or even the fourth objection and decides, actually, you know what? Maybe it isn't possible to do. Pretty much everything in the world is possible to do if you really set your mind to it. That, and that's the whole point of progress, right? If, if you know, everyone who is a naysayer was listened to, then the people who create innovative stuff that no one has ever seen before would not be able to do that. Right? But the whole point of taking you know, the big profits that come from really deep, clever innovation is being able to operate in spaces that others do not think are possible and then operate in those things and really nail that. So the mindset thing is really important, which is that you know, first principles thinking, uh, this is what we wanna achieve. These are the ways that we're gonna get there. These are the obstacles and this is how we overcome those obstacles and you know, let's crack on and do this thing. Again, easy to say, very hard to achieve. So there you have it, folks. That's my recipe for you to build your own Islamic fintech. Or frankly, the same recipe could be applied to any startup project. So please do crack on and build your own startups. And the reason why I wanted to create this video is because we're really keen for Muslims who are 20% poorer than the rest of the world to get back to even keel. Because if we can do that, then we can really materially help our community. And the best way to do that is to encourage the brightest and cleverest minds and the most hardworking people in our community to build innovative financial products and fintechs so that they can solve this problem of Muslims being able to invest and manage their personal finances in a really, really slick and effective way. If we nail that and we start narrowing that income inequality gap, then we've done a really good thing for this world. So that's my challenge and my encouragement to those of you who are entrepreneurial and who want to go into this space as well. Please do try. And if you do get yourself a product at the end of it, then let us know at Islamic Finance Guru. And we'd love to have you on the marketplace so that Muslim consumers can get in touch with you as well. Until next time, Assalamu Alaikum.